I know you said not to contact you. And I know how angry you must have been when you left. But there's things you need to know, Alice. Things I can't leave in a message. When I was little, everything would have been flames. What the hell happened out there? Alice is my granddaughter, and she will be living with us from now on. Oh, Alice. Alice. to us. How could you? I just promised I'd keep her safe. Can we do that, Twig? Welcome, everyone, to this special behind-the-scenes event about the lost flowers of Alice Hart with novelist Holly Ringland, and screenwriter and showrunner Sarah Lambert. I'm Kay Chubbuck, Vice President of Education at the New York Botanical Garden. As we begin, we acknowledge that the New York Botanical Garden is located on the ancestral homeland of the Lenape Delaware people. We honor them and acknowledge their displacement, dispossession, and continued presence. For those of you in the audience, I imagine that many of you, like me, have been watching the Amazon Prime series based on Holly's award-winning international bestseller starring uh, NYBG trustee Sigourney Weaver, who is just terrific in the series. The Lost Flowers of Alice Hart was Holly's debut novel. She's since published two more books, The Seven Skins of Esther Wilding and The House That Joy Built in Australia. For those of us in North America, Lost Flowers is widely available and The Seven Skins of Esther Wildling will be published in February. Lost Flowers was adapted for the screen by Sarah Lambert, the creator, writer, and producer of the smash hit Australian drama, Love Child. Sarah has had a long career writing on some of Australia's top series, including the critically acclaimed and award-winning Love My Way in a Place Called Home. Notably, The Lost Flowers of Alice Hart has become Amazon's most successful Australian original worldwide, with the most successful opening weekend globally for any Australian launch. It's reached the top five in 78 countries and the top three in 42 countries since it launched on August 4th. And there are two more episodes to go, including the finale on September 1st. So Holly and Sarah, thank you so much for joining us tonight to talk about, or today, depending on where you are in the world, to talk about The Lost Flowers. And Holly, I'm hoping you could start us off by providing an overview of the story for our viewers. Thank you, Kay. Uh, hello to everybody who's joined us and watching. Uh, I kind of got to shake that out because I still get such painful goosebumps when I see the trailer. And Sarah and I, well, Sarah more than me, but I must have seen the trailer maybe a hundred times already. And then a beautiful introduction like that. And I've got so much emotion in my body already. So uh, it's a real honor for me uh, to be with you and be in your company today. Uh, the Lost Flowers of Alice Hart, as you said, is my first novel. And it tells the story of nine-year-old Alice, that's how old she is when we meet her, who grows up in an isolated, idyllic coastal home between sugarcane fields and the sea, where her mother's flowers and their hidden meanings mostly shelter Alice from the harm caused by the unpredictable moods of her father when tragedy irrevocably happens in Alice's life, she meets a grandmother named June that she didn't know ever existed. And she is taken to live with June uh, on an Australian native flower farm called Thornfield that gives refuge to women who like Alice find themselves feeling lost or broken. In the Victorian tradition, uh, every flower at Thornfield has a meaning. And so as Alice settles into her life there, she learns to use this language of native Australian flowers to say things that are too hard to speak. But as she grows older, 
family secrecy, a devastating betrayal, and then a man who's not all he seems come together to make Alice realise that as healing as nature can be for us all, there are some stories that flowers alone cannot help us to tell. And if she is ever to have the freedom that she craves for her life and the agency and autonomy that she craves for her life, Alice has to find the courage to possess the most powerful story that she knows, which is her own. That's really incredible. And uh, Sarah, I'd love to hear from you about what drew you to Holly's novel and the desire to sort of adapt this for the screen. Firstly, thank you for having me here today. And it's so lovely to be here with you all. Um, when I first read the opening pages of Holly's book, I was completely um, taken in. And it, Holly has a really remarkable ability with her opening lines to really just draw you in. And it was this incredible image of just this nine-year-old child sitting at a desk in this house, a weatherboard cottage at the end of a long lane. And she was sitting there dreaming of ways to set her father on fire. Because if she did, then maybe out of the ashes might emerge a different man, um, one that she didn't have to worry about sort of protecting her mother from. Um, and it was such a powerful image and such an extraordinary opening. And I was just completely taken with this character of Alice, who was such an imaginative and extraordinary child and escaped into stories and nature as a way of coping. And I just found this, this girl, Alice Hart, so utterly compelling in her journey. But it was also this thing about writing about trauma, really writing about so many things that, you know, a lot of us can relate to, but in, in such a beautiful way, it was, even though it is very dark material, Holly had this uh, has this extraordinary ability to approach the material with a with a lightness, with a sense of wonder and a sense of joy, even in the darkest times of finding of finding, I guess, healing in nature. And I found that story really, really powerful. Um, and another thing, I guess, a theme in nearly all my work has been the power of story. You know, the idea of that stories can change the world, tell the right story and, and get that story out there. Stories have incredible power and there's such a, a great love of story and telling stories and, and ownership of story that I love so much. Um, and so that was really, as soon as I sort of read the book, I felt that this was a story that we had to bring to the screen. And um, I felt very passionate about doing that. No, that, that's that's really in incredible. I got chills hearing you talk about the the girl at the desk with the fire, actually, and and seeing that in the the series is, is really evocative as well. Uh, we're going to play another short clip right now, actually, of the Thornfield Dictionary and of um, young Alice uh, first looking at it with with Sigourney Weaver playing June, her, her grandmother. <clears throat> so, uh, Julia, you're going to play the clip? So I wanted to give you this. It's the Thornfield language of flowers. It was started by your great, great grandmother, Ruth. And then every generation has added to it. It's our very own secret language here. You pick out a flower, something special to you.
model always with you. So Holly, could you talk a little bit about um, your inspiration for creating this incredible language of flowers that we see throughout the story and that helps sort of Alice to find, find her voice? Absolutely. It, it seems such a strange thing, but writing Alice actually taught me about things that I find endlessly fascinating because of my own experiences of being alive that I didn't know I was drawn to. So as if, as if Alice herself uh, sort of led me to realize that I'm endlessly fascinated by the ways that we find to encode and tell our stories that are too hard or painful to speak. And we all do it, even when we don't realize that we do it. It might be that somebody that we love deeply has died and we can't talk about them because they're not here anymore. The loss of them is so painful that it's too hard to talk about. But we will do little things like wear certain talisman or colors or have little rituals like stir honey into your tea every day because it keeps that person close to us. It keeps the story of them near to us, just as an example. So in 2014, I was living in the UK. I was a shaky, um, brave, uh, scared, struggling with kind of post-traumatic stress and I didn't know it, uh, aspiring writer, wanted to be a writer since I was three. I was 34 at the time and I had written that opening line that Sarah described of the novel, which is in the weatherboard house at the end of the lane, nine-year-old Alice Hart sat at her desk by the window and dreamed of ways to set her father on fire. And from that point, as I wrote Alice's journey out of my body and onto the page, because that's where our stories live and are kept, our bodies are the keepers of our stories. I started to do research about how trauma can affect children. And I was in the UK at the time, so just bearing in mind uh, the Google algorithm in, you know, in accordance with our geography. So I was Googling how trauma affects children. And when a traumatic experience is too much for a child's brain, the child can go into selective muteness, which is what happens to Alice in the novel. It's not a, um, I don't think it's something that is entirely understood, the child stops speaking because the brain needs silence to try and process what has happened or to try and recover from a trauma that's too big to understand. So I'm Googling selective muteness in children in the UK and in my search results in academic articles and in pop magazines and that sort of thing comes up these uh, search results about the Victorian language of flowers. Now, just like everybody else, I'm sure we've all grown up as I did with just a loose understanding of the symbolism that flowers have. Like on Valentine's Day, you give people red roses because they symbolize love. Or, you know, my grandmother, whenever we would drive home to see granny, 
she'd be out at the flagpole, the, sorry, the telephone pole with a yellow flag tied around it, waving a yellow a tea towel and holding yellow flowers because for her, they meant sort of my love has come home. Uh, I don't know where granny got that from, but she was, you know, grannies have that authority over nature, over everything. So um, I had that loose understanding of the power and significance of flowers, but what blew my pants off was sitting in my office in Manchester and reading about this time during Queen Victoria's reign when emotional expression in social circles was considered vulgar. It was like the worst crime a person could commit, to speak loosely. I would have really not been, I would have been the most vulgar woman anywhere in Victorian times running around saying, this is how I feel. How are you feeling? How are you? Um, and I was really captured by this craze that swept uh, Europe and North America where people would construct and deliver to each other and give each other the most elaborate, beautiful bouquets the language was so prolific that in middle class households there would be a dictionary so that when the butler you know answered the door and received the flowers you know the whole the whole sentiment of the bouquet could be understood so that was enchanting but what really got me was when i read that during this time period people didn't just send each other bouquets to express pleasurable emotion and feeling and sentiment People sent each other's, like sent each other bouquets to basically flip the bird, to basically say to people, I cast a curse on your life and house and don't ever darken my doorstep with your presence ever again. But they would say it in the most extraordinary bouquet of foxgloves or lilies, which are poisonous. When I read that, that was my aha moment. And that's when I thought, I want to do this with the flowers that I grew up with in the gardens of the women who raised me. I want to do this with Australian flora. And I was, of course, met with tidal waves of immediate self-doubt and anxiety and inner critic. Is this a dumb idea? Can I do this? No one's going to believe me. But it really struck that tuning fork in my soul where I knew it was right so I just persisted with creating it. And that that was how it that was how it began. And now I'm sitting here with Sigourney Weaver playing June, telling Alila Brown as Alice, here's the Thornfield language of flowers. It's yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, and it's I, I love how in your novel you use the symbolism to kind of organize the chapters and you have these these beautiful botanical illustrations by artist Edith Rewa at the start of each chapter that are just just you know really powerful especially I mean I'm coming from a place where we teach botanical illustrations as one of our core disciplines so it's really amazing to see they're and so beautiful I, I have them tattooed all over my arm I have Edith's botanical illustrations tattooed over, all over my arm for Alice so they really are something. And Sarah, I love how you used a similar strategy to kind of organize the different episodes of the series, because I imagine that that's one of the challenges is taking something that's so visual, um, but also literate, and then translating it to a different medium is, is quite challenging. <laughs> so I'd love to have you talk, Sarah, a little bit about um, creating this dictionary and how your, your thought process behind conveying this symbolism of flowers. And we have a few slides that we can show um, as well of sort of close-ups of this really incredible book that you created as part of the show. Wonderful. Um, so one of the things that really moved me about the book was the Thornfield flower, of, uh, language of flowers. And we wanted to create it, but what moved me especially was that it wasn't Victorian, it was ours. It was an Australian wildflower dictionary and that meant a hell of a lot to me but also that it was a living language. It wasn't something that was being published. It was this family's dictionary. You know, it was it was created by a great grandmother and it was always added to by different, you know, generations and different women that had come through this, this place. And so when we were creating it, it, made, it, it meant that it had to have that homemade quality. It had to have that, that you could almost see that each individual 
um, person, you know, their their language, their sentiments, their kind of version of, of truth. We wanted to sort of be able to see it in the book itself. And so that became a real, real thing. Um, and our, we had an extraordinary production designer, Melinda Doring, who is probably one of the best in the world. And the team that came together to create this book, the book was everything to all of us, to Glendon Ivan, who was our director and our producing team, you know, Jody Madison and Bruna, all of us were being obsessed with getting this book completely right because it meant so much. Um, and, you know, how to translate it to the screen. And so it has quite an extraordinary journey, really. Um, we, we definitely wanted it to, to feel like a living language so that it was, you know, that we could actually do dialogue with it and sort of use it all the way and have meaning and kind of create story through it. And we had this extraordinary experience that there was this um, fantastic woman called Ara Steele, who was um, Melinda Doring's design assistant, and her grandmother, Nuri Mass, had had been a botanical artist. She had created her own wildflower dictionary of Australian flowers. And so uh, Nuri brought in these extraordinary drawings of hers and they were of, you know, kangaroo paws and, and extraordinarily, uh, you know, were kangaroo paws, there were um, all the different native wildflowers, you know, the Kudamundra wattles, all of these different things. And so we really used those drawings of her grandmother to begin this process. And a lot of them were just um, sketches. She'd done endless sketches that were black and white and incredibly beautiful. And so uh, what Melinda did was then to get those, use them as a basis for a lot of the different things you see in this book. And then we had them colorized by different artists who came through and just to make them feel more alive. And then as we went on, um, we started, we got different artists, different botanical artists to, um, there's a hero uh, uh, piece at the end, which is a Sturt Desert Pea, which is incredibly important in our story. It means um, have courage, take heart. And it's one of the most important things in, in the sort of language of flowers. And that is actually a fold out that we created at the end of the book. And that was created by Edith, Barrett and uh, she did such a beautiful job it's just an incredible piece of art but if you looked at each how much love and time and effort was put into each and every drawing in this book it went backwards and forwards everyone it really did feel like this family this family of women creating a book that you know um it's really an extraordinary work of art and um it, it conveyed everything that you could ever dream for, you know, um, and bringing something from a book into, you know, uh, to the screen. And so it was just a really extraordinary process. Yeah, I feel like you, you need to have a museum exhibition of some of the pieces you created for the show, because like this in particular is just extraordinary. It's, it's so beautiful and, and elaborate as, as you described. It's really incredible. Yeah. It, it's also, if you look in the, the entire series, there are paintings on the walls that, that were done for Thornfield that Melinda did and so many different artists um, on that team, all of native wildflowers. And I think that meant a lot to me in, in starting the project. I mean, I had a, a Victorian language of flowers when I was growing up, but until Holly's book, I'd really never taken in our language, our, our language of flowers, this idea of our botanical history and kind of and really embraced it. And um, and I think since then, it's not only me, but every one of us who worked on this show, we've become sort of obsessed. <laughs> you know, like I only have uh, native wildflowers now around me. Like I, that's what I sort of look for. And and it, it became a sort of uh, a sort of joyous experience to find a new language, uh, a new language to sort of communicate in. And that really comes um, from Holly's book with, and, and bringing it to the screen. No, it's it's. Thank you so much for sharing that. That's that's really amazing. And again, like yeah, the the wallpaper, everything is just so uh, perfect in, in every scene. Another really powerful aspect of the the story that I think is really moving is that it takes place across so many different landscapes of Australia. Um, Holly, you mentioned at the beginning the the cane fields along the coast where where the story begins. Uh, June's flower farm, which is more inland, the national park and the desert where the, the desert peas and the crater are incredibly important part of the story. And I don't want to talk too much about it because that's where we are right now in the, the series. 
um, and it's sacred to the first people of Australia. And in many ways, it seems that landscape becomes almost like a, a character in, in the story. And I'd love, Holly, um, for you to talk a little bit about what you write at the very, in the credits at the end of the novel about how Australia always was and always will be Aboriginal land. And if you could speak to this theme and sort of the latter half of the story and how it relates to, to the landscape. I'd be honored to. I don't think it was an uncommon experience that I had in my very good public schooling education in the eighties that I grew up being educated on an exclusively white story about Australia, which is that our story began when Captain Cook arrived. That was my primary school education about the beginning of this continent that raised me the landscapes on this continent that raised me. My full understanding or a broader understanding, I should say, of how incorrect that story that I learned as a child was, was when I had the enormous honour and privilege in my 20s of living on and off for four years on Anunu land in the desert in the Northern Territory uh, around the area of Uluru and Kata Judah. Uh, which in uh, their colonial names are Ayers Rock and the Olgas. I was uh, a park ranger and I lived um, in an Aboriginal community and worked um, with Aboriginal colleagues and friends. And it was that experience that changed my understanding of being a human being, an Australian and a global citizen. And so when I was writing this novel, it was a few years after I had left living in the desert. And it was really important to me right from the outset that when Alice's story goes into and onto that land and onto that landscape, the flowers that open each chapter header and the flowers that are featured uh throughout the desert landscapes in the story are referred to and named wherever possible and appropriate in their first name, in their Pitanjara language name, because uh, Aboriginal people are the first storytellers in their medicinal qualities and their emotive qualities and their decorative qualities. Aboriginal people are the first tellers and speakers of a language of plants and flowers and trees. So in a way to honour and acknowledge and respect the information that I learned about Australian flora living on Anunu land in the desert, I used the Pitanjara language to, uh, to name those plants and flowers uh, as I should, as I should. And that was a really vital thing to include in the story wherever I could. And I think where we are in the series, we're just about to delve a little bit uh, deeper in into that, that history. What was it like to work together on the, the film? Because I know, Holly, you were on set for, for much of the filming, I believe, and I'd love to hear about uh, the friendship also that developed between the two of you working on the show. <laughs> Do you want to go? You want to? Who, where do we start? <laughs> you start. Uh, I had basically, when I, once I'd read the novel and I'd found out that um, made up stories had the rights to it and had gone and begged my case that I should be the writer to uh, adapt this. Um, they, uh, I was heading to England and I got to uh, fly out and meet with Holly in London. And I arrived in this cafe, uh, like a restaurant, and I was quite nervous because, you know, you're always nervous, kind of trying to sort of, you know, seeing if you're going to get on and if this relationship's going to work. And um, we walked in and uh, it was like recognizing an old friend. <laughs> and we ended up sitting down at this table and just talking and uh, and talking and talking until the point where we realized that we'd actually shut the restaurant. They were trying to get us to leave. Um, we had so much in common and so much to share that that was sort of the beginning of 
it, it was sort of uncanny. We we do share just such a, amazing history. Like there are things in our backgrounds that are very similar and um, yeah, so it felt like really meeting a, a soulmate. And then we went on an adventure together because I, I always feel that when you're going to do an adaptation, it's very important to um, to almost kind of take on the voice of the author, of the original writer. You, you really have to sort of immerse yourself in that voice and in the way the world is seen. So as you expand it for television, because that's what happens, you expand on characters and you expand on storylines. Unless you have that connection and, and sort of, uh, it's. I, I think it's almost impossible to do justice to it. So we went on this adventure together. Uh, we went to the Northern Territory and flew in there and I lived, the, <laughs> my favorite thing is that Holly even had her old Rangers uniform. <laughs> and we went on this incredible adventure together, which you should talk a little bit about. It was hilarious. It was wondrous. It was, we had the, it, it was all thanks to the the backing of the team that made up stories, wasn't it? They they sort of said, off you go, go and um go into the desert together. So uh we flew into Mabantua, which is Alice Alice Springs, and uh we hired a Toyota Land Cruiser, which I mentioned because they're quite signature to life in the desert, you know, like a troop carrier is kind of what everybody gets around in, I guess. And even if you, even if it's not a land cruiser, everyone just calls them troopies. So I, it felt very much when Sarah and I are together, it's like um, time and age and all of these things in the normal world don't exist. And so it just felt a little bit like our spirits were teenagers let loose on their BMX bikes together in the desert. <laughs> And we picked up our rental car and sort of hoisted ourselves up into it. And I kind of looked at her and I was like, let's go, babe. Off we go. <laughs> Let me show you like my old. <laughs> but it was um, it was such an incredible, I mean, Sarah's called it an odyssey before. And it really was. It was, it, there were moments that were really, really, really hard for me uh, to go back there for many different reasons and to show Sarah, and Sarah is the woman that's like, I need to find a bottle of champagne in the desert for this woman. So, you know, and she did because that's who she is. And so we just have this strange, um, I, I, it's really rare when this happens in our lives. And I think if we're lucky enough, we can recognize that it doesn't need to be because you're meeting somebody adapting your novel. It's when you meet someone who is, utterly familiar to you immediately and you have never met them before but you have the courage to lean in and open up and the rewards are great and deep and vast and and ongoing I mean we met in 2018 or 2019 and and years on you know I I feel like we're sort of some sort of hallmark hallmark card <laughs> couple when I'm like we're only getting started <laughs> the best that's yet to come but how you know and you say that having gone through this incredible experience of melding our minds and and our lives and and through our relationship with each other and developing trust and and really feeling that together that there's sort of the Alice Hart that lives in me and there's who she has become through Sarah and then there is who she is. And when I say Alice, I mean the whole world of her. There is who she is once she's gone through the hundreds of minds and bodies of the people who have collaborated and made this show like Glendon Ivan, the director, Melinda Doring, the production, you know, Jody Madison, the producer, like, and, the, you know, we could sit here and rattle off the name call, but it would be worse than sort of university graduation. Like, it's, <laughs> there are hundreds of people through whose souls this story has has travelled to make the series. And, and Sarah and I just feel like, I don't know, the beginning of the river or something. And, and what it has expanded out into is what everybody um, can watch in the series or read in the novel. I mean, you know. Yes, no, we, we very much hope that people do read the novel and we have <laughs> uh, 
sale in our shop at NYBG and also also online and, and uh, through the independent publisher that that you worked with in the U.S. Yes. I think that also, so I mean, that's the journey to to think about how you were going to make the the series. What was it actually like to be on set during the filming and to watch what you had imagined uh, literally be embodied both through the characters and the sets? Oh, Kay, it was it was two years ago, and I still I still don't understand the feeling. I still uh, I still don't know how to describe it. I've never described I've never experienced anything like it. I I don't know many people who get to. So I don't know how to say to somebody, what do you mean this carving exists? I made it up when I was sitting in my pants the day that I dropped my avocado toast on the floor and felt like I was a total failure in my life. And now I'm standing in front of it. Someone's job has been to carve a sculpture that I made up in my brain and now it's in front of me and I can touch it. And, you know, then there's a moment where I'm on set. Having grown up with my mum, one of our favourite movies being Working Girl, and I'm sitting on the veranda of a house that I made up on a flower farm that I made up. And there's like this motion kind of off in the flower field in the distance. And I look up and here's this like group of people kind of walking together. And I look closer and there's Sigourney Weaver dressed as a cat, dressed as June, walking like June, getting ready to shoot a scene as June. And I, I was sitting on the brand and I, I think I was like, and at that moment she looked at me across the flower fields and I don't know, you know, there was just a moment where I'm like, is she, she can't be looking at me. What, like, what? And she's looking at me and she was sort of gliding across the flower fields and she just saw me and she was like, and I nearly fell off <laughs> So we got some time to sit and talk together. And as I did with the rest of the cast, the amazing, brilliant cast on this show. And I think I will be 400 years old before I ever find words to describe what those experiences felt like and what they mean to me. I will cherish them for as long as I'm lucky enough to live truly. It's really incredible. Yeah, no, the, the reason we're doing this event tonight is that uh, she had recommended I, I read your novel and that- I can't secret. cope with that, Kate. Who can cope with this? <laughs> Nobody. I can't cope with it. Oh, Sigourney just wrecked. When you sent me that very first email and you were like, hi, Holly, you know, Sigourney is one of our trustees and she recommended, I was like, stop. <laughs> my When my agent responded to that, it was his, and we were talking to Prime Video about it. His response was, Holly's going to be really cool and breezy about this. <laughs> he was not wrong. No, it was, uh, it's an amazing book. And I, I, my understanding is most of the people who are on the set had read it as well. So that it was, you had a, a wide familiarity with the novel in, in creating the series. I think yeah. it was, it's an interesting thing is that, you know, you, you you write the, you know, we worked on this this show for such a long time, and then you know that we we managed to get it made. And normally, you know, I've done adaptations before, and and people have just read the scripts, but this time around, it was really beautiful because, you know, pretty much I'd say everybody had read the book and or was reading the book on set or was, you know making flower things it was just very we were all together for a very long time it was you know it was such a long shoot it was one of the most complicated and um ambitious things I think any of us had ever done you know and it went it was like a traveling sort of sideshow we went from town to town all across Australia making this thing and but we were very much a family of of crew and cast and you'd turn around and there'd be people you know uh reading the book um in their breaks 
and also coming up and telling their story, like their relationship to the themes of, uh, you know, of trauma and, and family violence and all these different things and different relationships that are brought up. And so it was it was a book that touched so many people. And therefore, I think there was an incredible passion um, that came to the scripts and came to the, the shoot and came. And I think you can see it. Um, a real love for the material in every single frame of the, the show. It was made with a hell of a lot, a hell of a lot of love and a hell of a lot, a lot of passion. Uh, and it's rare. It really is rare. Yeah, no, it's uh, I, I love the anecdotes that I've I've read about everyone reading it on the. I mean, as someone who is a reader and a lover of books, I think that that's really powerful. What do you both most that hope? What do you both most hope that audiences will will take away from the story of Alice Hart, whether they read the novel, see the series, both? What's the takeaway? Uh. I guess for me, I, I feel like that though the story goes into sort of dark territory, I, I feel that this the series is very much um, a show about that we are not alone. You know, we go through these experiences and if you're lucky to get through life without trauma, then um, you're very, very lucky. But a lot of people in this life go through uh, many of the experiences that these characters go through. And I hope that at the end of the series that they feel that um, one, that they're not alone, that there's that you can get through things, that there is a, there is a power in sharing your story and, and having a voice um, and using it. Um, but also that sisterhood, uh, there's a real sisterhood that kind of comes through that you'll see by the end of the, the, the series and, and that power of friendship and the power of, of of sharing a story and not being alone and that you can not only move forward in your life but also thrive um so i i really feel like that's the sort of message of the show and um and hopefully that people when they watch it will come away feeling a sense of hope and a sense of resilience and a sense of um yeah of of uh the power to survive we're survivors and we move forward uh, so that's that's what I feel. But I also just hope they have a really good time watching it because it's an incredible, you know, it's just, it's a great mystery and it's got a great, it's got extraordinary characters who go through incredible journeys and it, and it's a really enjoyable watch. So I, I hope that people get to the end and and feel that. It's so Holly, it, yeah. it's so beautiful to hear Sarah say that because it's it's a it's a translation and a transmission through the power of story that sometimes we can't quite understand other than to just feel it. The one of the strangest things about this whole experience and about being here and, and talking about this is that this started, this the idea of this story picked me when I was at a moment alone in my life at my desk wondering if I had the courage and feeling like I didn't to turn towards my imagination rather than away from it because I had been turning away from it for decades because I had been too scared of not being good enough to try and do the one thing I've known about myself since I was three that's never changed, which is write stories. So at Nearly 10 years ago, I had this burning story in my chest, in my body that wanted to be told. I didn't know how to tell it. I didn't think I could. I wasn't sure if I was allowed. I didn't know how to give myself permission. And the thing that drove me to that page was I didn't want to waste my life living in fear any longer. And I wanted to know that if I wrote this story, could it be like the practice that I grew up with hiking in the bush as a kid, where so commonly bushwalkers in the Australian forest will use a Darug word, cooey. And when you're walking through the bush, you cooey out into the bush because the echo, it's kind of coo 
And that sound echoes through the bush. So even if you're long distances away from someone, they will cooey back to you like birds talking to each other and you know you're not alone. That was truly in my pyjamas full of quivering self-doubt and fear. I wrote this story or started to write it because I just wanted to know that if it ever saw the light of day, I wasn't alone. And the fact that that has translated and resonated with readers and that it has translated and resonated in hearing Sarah talk about it and people's responses to the series and everybody that worked on it. it I think it brings us kind of full circle to the power of story that we were talking about right at the beginning. And we're just mere mortals basking in it, you know, the power that a story has, the life that it has. It's really beautiful. That in some ways explains maybe the meaning behind the desert pea that is sort of that central uh, flower that, that you come back to again and again throughout the story of the have, have courage, take heart. Hey, I used to see them. They grew in the cracks between rocks at, in the car park of the desert supermarket that I would go to. These extraordinary otherworldly mind-blowing red native flowers. And then once I started learning about them, they can survive extreme weather conditions. But if you disturb their roots, they can perish. They're extremely hard to propagate, yet they can grow in the wild and fill gullies so it's just an ocean of red flowers. And when I started learning about these growing habits and I was choosing what meaning to give them because I knew it had to be really special, I thought that feels a lot like courage. It's, it's really powerful. And I feel like that's the word to, to end on in some ways, the, the courage and to, to you know have courage, take heart in the survival of the plants. I think the healing power of nature throughout the, the novel and the series is just incredibly powerful. And thank you for writing the novel and thank you, Sarah, for adapting it into this incredibly gorgeous series. And thank you both for participating tonight uh, in New York time, uh, morning, very early morning in, in Australia time with this event with the New York Botanical Garden. I also want to thank everyone in the audience who, who tuned in um, from, from all over the world. Thank you for, for coming, to, coming to this event and uh, Julia behind the scenes uh, for, for running the, the videos and the, the images as well as, as Nadine. Um, the Lost Flowers of Alice Hart, as we mentioned, is on sale uh, both on our, our shop online and in person. We encourage everyone to, to read the book. It goes even deeper into the characters from the series if, you're, if you're, uh, that's captured your interest. We also encourage you to take classes with us. We offer online courses in gardening, horticulture, horticultural therapy, which I think again is appropriate for this theme as well as botanical illustration. And if you enjoyed the Botanical Illustrations and Holly's story, we have a number of beginner courses where you can, can learn to start making uh, illustrations like that yourself and creating your own plant portraits. So Holly and Sarah, thank you again. Um, I can't wait for episode six, uh, which is uh, this Friday, and then the series finale, which is, is uh, right around the corner. So thank, thank you, you so much. much, Kay. Thank you for a beautiful conversation. Sarah, I love you. You know that. I'm publicly declaring it. <laughs> And thank you all um, for having us. It's been such a delight. Really lovely. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.